this. Sorry, I wanted, okay. I totally forgot to jump in. I'm sorry. And of course, my friend, whoever voiced that thing, <laughs> I want to make sure that we get this recorded <laughs> so that I can yeah. post it on um, on yeah. YouTube after the, after the thing. Sorry. Great. Um, no problem. Sorry to interrupt. So your dad was a, oh, was a bassist and he was yeah, traveling jazz around bassist. all the um, He was mostly regional. Um, it was, he, he was in demand, but it was hard with, you know, a young, a young kid. And um, when I was younger, when I was around four or five, he pivoted into um, being a luthier. Uh, so he first started making guitars and then eventually learned how to make basses. And now he's one of the most famous makers of the upright bass in the world. Wow. Yeah, his name is Arnold Schnitzer. You can check him out online. Arnold, okay. And so I, you said a word that I don't know. Luthier? Luthier. Luthier. Uh, a stringed instrument maker. That's amazing. There you go. And he, does he have his shop still in Westchester or did he? He do does it? not. He recently moved to um, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's actually here in the Massachusetts, Connecticut area right now because he took a road trip, which is cool. So he has... Um, a super cool setup there with like an overhang outside and he can do half his work inside and half his work outside but he's he's doing less now he's also making cellos now um so but you know he's always had like men, a many year waiting list he's got bases in all the major orchestras and opera houses around around That's incredible so wow. it's pretty cool so yeah so i grew up with music i grew up with entrepreneurs um you know my father ran his own business and, and my mom ran a typing service called wordsmith for many years and then she became a French and Spanish teacher. She speaks five languages. So like the big joke was like, you have the musician and the, and the linguist, and then you put them together, you get a singer, right? <laughs> That's so. amazing. <laughs> um, they are divorced and remarried, but you know, the, the, the fact remains that right. here I am. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I grew up with music. I love jazz. I still I still love jazz. I actually get to record a jazz piece tomorrow, which is super cool. Oh, through, wow. through Longy. I'll tell you more about that later. That's great. But okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I sang. I was kind of shy as a kid, which is usually shocking to people. And I sang in, in chorus. And one day, David Becker was like, you should try out for the solo. And I was like, I don't know what you're smoking. Now, um, is this in like high school or junior high? This or was what? Uh, seventh grade, I think, maybe. Okay. Yeah, so I did, and and it was very breathy. I was very like, like a bridge over trouble. That was the solo. I'll yeah. never, obviously never forget. So I got the solo, and I sang it with my knees shaking in seventh grade. And um, my mom was like, why don't you take some voice lessons? So I did, but like my teacher, who was super cool, um, she was more of a musical theater teacher, and it just like never felt like the right fit. So then um, I swapped over to an opera teacher, whatever that meant. Still in, I didn't, still in junior high? No, I was 15 at that point. So oh, okay, I, okay. you know, did lots of like, nyang, 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 with my musical theater teacher. And then was like, this is not th what I want to do. Right. And it's just like, I, I didn't really like that kind of music very much. So yeah, so I, I started studying with a classical teacher. And I mean, the rest is history. Like I just loved the repertoire. And I was like, totally, totally enthralled with it. Um, but I also had a lot of other interests and I played the cello for a long time. And I, I struggled with whether or not to go to school for music and originally applied for college as a psychology major, which is another one of my passions. Oh, wow. Um, and then I like changed my mind last minute and switched to music ed. And that's, that's how I started out. You mean before you went? Yeah. I literally like called the schools that I'd applied to and was like, can you switch my major? And they were like, yes but you need to send us this like these pre-screens and I didn't even know what that meant it was like a whole thing but wow. it worked out I um I ended up as a music ed major at UMass Amherst okay and what an amazing school like just a really really great place where you get sort of the really concentrated music education but within a greater university and it's affordable and just amazing teachers that's and awesome oh by the way I, Nathan, yeah. Nathan Troop and Solveig Olsen say hi oh hey guys what's up yeah, Nathan said uh, he's off to a rehearsal, but loves seeing us chatting. And and Solvay says hi, Dana. Well, hi, hi Solvay. Solvay. Yeah, awesome. I am seeing Nathan tomorrow to hang out. So see you oh, then. Cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, so yeah. you you called and changed your music major. So you went into Amherst and you were uh, a music ed major. And at that time, um, did you have 
I mean, I, I assume with voice emphasis or was this more of like voice and cello or did you continue to pursue cello? No, I eventually just had to let it go because I got so entrenched in the, in the, sorry, let me close that, in the uh, singing world. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was a voice emphasis. And then um, I think it was sophomore year, maybe junior year, early junior year. I can't remember. We had to do observations and I was like, nope. <laughs> definitely not doing that <laughs> you mean like where you had to go to like a high school surround nearby and... high school middle school elementary school and I was like okay and that, that's what made you realize you do not want to be a high school or a junior high choir so director. so so much respect for k-12 through music educators you guys that are was amazing my mom, my mom amazing. and my stepdad my stepdad was actually my high school choir director that's awesome and starting my <laughs> My sophomore year, my mom came over. She was a junior high choir director, and then she got a promotion, ended up being the assistant choir director at my high school. So for my uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year, they were there together, but they had been working together for years. And then long after I graduated, um, they eventually you know, fell in love and got married. And the stupid rule of the district was that you can't be married to someone and work in the same school. So then she had to leave. You know, They created this great team, and they were there <laughs> teaching, you know. And yeah. then she had to leave and go get a job. But anyway, yeah, uh, that life and that sort of responsibility of, of um, teaching junior high and high school choir, that's, that's, I have a great deal of respect for those. Yeah. Folks. And I've always struggled with anxiety and it just was very anxiety provoking to be in those observations. And I knew immediately that that was not the right fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sort of panicked and then, uh, I switched to be a performance major and knew nothing about the industry. Most undergrads don't more on that later. And, um, <laughs> and I, I was really curious about private teaching. So I took on a friend, like just to, you know, see what that was like, taught her in a practice room and I loved it, loved it, loved it. So I really kind of started teaching privately junior year, right, right then. And and I knew, I knew that that was going to be a huge part of my life. I was way more sure about that than the singing thing. Wow. That's awesome. So that's something that sort of has always been weird about me is that like teaching has always been my number one passion uh, above all. And I knew that it was the one-on-one -on -one thing that I was really jiving I, with. I don't find that to be weird. I find that, I mean, it, Yay! you know. I, I, mean, I feel like most people I meet start as singers and like eventually discover their love for teaching. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but it was cool. Well, I have to say, I mean, I had a similar experience when I was a grad student at Indiana University. I had one of their financial aid packages that they call an AI, an associate instructor, where mm -hmm. you teach like non-major, like theater majors or, or whatever that have to take voice for their degree plan. And for me, that was the first time <clears throat> that I had ever taught like a formal lesson. Cool. And I fell in love with it. I was like, yeah. this is one of the, because it's like you get this opportunity to sort of take the information that you have acquired, you know, uh, you know, depending on how many teachers or whatever it was, but then sort of translate it and then share. And yeah, I mean, for me that, that I knew it, I don't know if it was my number one passion, but it was definitely for me, like equal to performing. Like I've cool. always been equally passionate about teaching as I have been performing. So nice. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So Very would cool. you say, I mean, the teacher that you had at Amherst um, as an education major, and I'm, I'm not familiar with that school at all, but you know, some mm -hmm. schools, if you're, if you're music ed, you don't get with like the, whatever, the, 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 the fancy teachers or whatever, or, or was this sort of an environment where you, you had um, excellent instruction and, and, you know, I mean, some of them even require, you know, if you're not a major, you, you end up studying with like a TA or. No, what? no. So, th so there's always been three voice teachers there. I actually was a full-time faculty member there for two years in an interim oh. position uh, from uh, 2013 to 15. So I had the great pleasure of going back. And um, by the way, this week, our, our whole UMass Amherst community is mourning the loss of our head of collaborative piano, Nadine Shank. So that's been a big, uh, a big loss for our, for all of us this week. So I just want to put that out there yeah. that we're very sad um, and we'll miss her greatly. But so there's three voice teachers at all times. And uh, I would say I studied with Marjorie Melnick, who is still uh, an important friend and mentor to me. And uh, I would say at the time she wasn't considered a fancy teacher. She is now she's been there forever and she's an amazing teacher. And um, she had a, 
she's a mezzo. She had a great career in Germany. Um, she's uh, like the diction woman. Mm. And, uh, you know, when we were working together, she was, she was always honest about the things she didn't know. And what was cool was a lot of things we sort of explored together. So I almost felt like I was more part of the process, but, but she was a great fit for me and she gave me fantastic fundamentals, um, and never assigned repertoire that was too crazy for me. And it was just like, and like pushed me just enough. And I, I was very, very fortunate to be with Marjorie. So she's, she's awesome. And, and it was really cool to go back and get to be on the faculty with her. That's great. Yeah. I would imagine. So yeah. the other two faculty members at present are Bill Height and Jamie Rose Guarine. Okay. Yeah. So really, really great teachers there. And so as you were working through your undergraduate career and once you had switched back to performance, do you remember some of the things that you were sort of struggling with or, or like technically what were some of the things that, um, you know, you had to work through or was it, you know, by the way, your dad says, hello, offspring, you sound smart. <laughs> That's great. That sounds like Arnold. Hi, Arnold. Hey, <laughs> dad. Okay, to meet you, Arnold. You sound like a great guy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, were you, because of the, the gifts of which your parents bestowed upon you, did you just have sort of a, a, a really great natural instrument or were you, you know, did you have to sort of struggle through that, those technical challenges? And, and mm. if so, what kind of things were you faced with? Yeah, I would say that I had a pretty, pretty good natural instrument. Um, I never struggled much with breathing. That's something that always came very naturally to me. So Congratulations. Um, right? <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, my bigger issue was uh, court, like closure and just breathiness yeah. in general and, you know, breathiness from, from issues with cord closure and breathiness from really, really low palate. Mm. Um, so that was a struggle, sort of just trying to focus the sound, which is ironic because now like I'm like all the Chiaro all the time. But uh, that, that was a struggle just to get things organized. And I had a lot of trouble in the passaggio. I mean, who didn't, who doesn't, right? And I was terrified of high notes. Like I will never forget trying to sing Ella Fui in studio class senior year and just crying. Oh no. And I'm not a crier. Like I never cried and it was very rare, but I, pff, I just was like, this is, why is this so hard? And the reason it's so hard is because you bang through the passaggio F sharp, F sharp, F sharp, F sharp before you get to go to the A. So it's like the approach, right? But right. Yeah, the high notes were scary. I sang Rosalinda and the Flader Mouse and like the bees were just, I would like stay up at night and just be like. <laughs> um, I would say those were my my big struggles. Oh, I should also, men also mention that while I was there, I got really into choral conducting. Oh. Because there's a very strong, very strong um, oral skills there, very strong music theory, very strong conducting program. And okay. I got really into choral conducting and then I was feeling all torn senior year. Like, what do I want to go to grad school for? Right. I was panicking because I like, I loved oral skills. I was TA for it senior year. I'm like a huge sight singing nerd. That's and, awesome. and I really got into conducting and I liked the challenge of it. And so what I decided to do and Marjorie supported me, even though she thought I was crazy, was I applied for half my grad schools as choral conducting and half as vocal performance. And I was like, let's just see what happens. Right, right. Um, didn't realize how, like, you know, didn't realize that choral conducting positions were not really, like, for the 21-year-old who had very, very little experience. So um, didn't go so well. But I did get into BU and New England Conservatory for vocal performance. And when I got the letter from NEC, I, like, almost passed out. So at that time, I didn't know that I was at that level. I had no idea. I did not realize that I was there and mm. I never really thought I'd get in. Wow. Um, well, backing, backing up just a second. So you mentioned that you sort of had trouble with high notes and, you know, working through the passaggio and yeah. did, did Elizabeth, yeah? Uh, Marjorie. Malibu. Marjorie, sorry. Yeah, did no, Marjorie, Elizabeth. did Marjorie help? How did Marjorie help you sort of find more confidence in that or was that something I mean you mentioned crying on your senior performance class but I mean do you remember what sorts because you know I mean again the whole premise of this is to talk about the different challenges and struggles yep. that we've all had but also those little light bulb moments where we're like oh right okay so do you remember like during your undergraduate studies like a moment where it clicked where you were like that's how I don't make a breathy sound or like oh, that's how I need to approach my high notes. Was it something specific that's kind of stayed with you or has that sort of been something that has just sort of been a, 
thing that we're on set on set work was big you know most of my just like learning to actually get a clean on set that wasn't overly glottalized or overly breathy i always Mm -hmm. talk about glottal like the glottal onset as um being on a one to ten scale yeah and like finding that like three (laughs) it's tricky you know three towards Um, the breathy three towards uh no 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 like i i was like at a one and you know a 10 would be like i wouldn't demonstrate it because i don't want to hurt myself and your your head would explode yeah right the sort of three to four is where you don't really hear the stroke but you you get a nice a nice clear clear start to the sound so i remember doing a lot of work on onsets and that being revolutionary for figuring out like if you get the onset right the rest of the phrase follows right yeah yeah um that was big and i do also remember that marjorie was sort of the introduction to my love of and obsession with the tongue and singing um the the tongue and singing that's my big thing i am like the everybody in boston knows me about knows me for this like i talk about the tongue until the cows come home i think it's probably the most important thing in singing i'm obsessed and that started there specifically talking about like how the unwanted muscular effort created by the base of the tongue can have such a impact on singing um, that's, or, or that's part of it i mean the darn thing has a zillion muscles and it takes up half your head so like it's right. safe to say that it affects just about everything in singing right true, true so i mean i sort of approach the tongue from all angles literally um so yeah uh issues from the base of overworking and um the tongue helping with adduction and the tongue essentially acting as a support mechanism that's something that i really work to correct and i also um I wish I could remember, I can't remember if it was Marjorie or, or later on was my first introduction to the idea of not forward tongue, but high back tongue. Yeah. 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 And that, that, the tongue. yeah. And I was really fortunate to be introduced to that, like before it was trendy for people to know that that's a cool thing to know about that actually really helps your singing. Okay. Cause it's like, I feel like now we're talking about that a lot more and, um, in the 90s and early 2000s, I feel like there was still a lot of flat tongue singing. Huh. I was very fortunate that I had a teacher in undergrad starting in the early 90s that talked about it all the time. He, That's fantastic. He would, he would, I mean, he was a great singer himself and he would, yeah. he, while he did the majority of the instruction by demonstrating, he definitely demonstrated with a very high arch in the tongue and the tip of the tongue was always right behind the bottom teeth. And yeah. so there was a, there was a good amount of positive. And I think there's, you know, so not only do you not want the tongue flat, but I think there's a difference too, between like having the natural hump at the back that just happens when your tongue is free versus right. when you're kind of here and then you, you kind of, uh-huh. right. Like if you're slamming it forward, then that doesn't correct the issues at the root. Anyway, very passionate about the tongue. No, no, so. this is great. This is, this is the whole thing. This is, yeah. this is amazing. And I think that so many people, I mean, as you said, so many, so m- many of a- anyone who has ever studied singing, whether they realize it or not, have had issues with the tongue because of it, course. Just, it gets in the way. Kayla, yeah. Jane, uh, Godero, Godero. The, Godero. the darn thing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Danica, Danica Buckley says that y'all met at UMass and so glad that y'all did. Amazing teacher, friend, colleague, soloist, entrepreneur. Yeah. Oh, she's so the they're best. all here supporting us. Yay. Which is great. Hi, guys. Um, Yay. Yeah. You know, I've also found, you know, such a difference, especially more from the teaching side, because, well, I, I, I will say that um, uh, I think it was my, my graduate school teacher at Indiana, James McDonald, who helped me understand that the tongue can also widen right? So that you can feel a, a fatter or a wider tongue and that the whole thing can possess that arch. And I think for some reason that was the tension that I personally was holding. And I, I kept, I kept a very narrow tongue mm-hmm. and it was like that moment of release that I had. I remember being like, Oh, well that feels totally different. Like it was like, mm. Oh, I can make resonance. You know, it's like, <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. a huge part of it. So that's awesome that you work so much with that. Yeah, and I also um, I have I work with a lot of Chinese singers, and I find that tongue tension is without a doubt the number one number one uh, struggle from a technique perspective. And because so, of their language. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, for sure. And uh, there's also you know, of course, there's good training there, um, but there's also not good training, like everywhere, and a lot of a lot of like 
just constant, constant forward focus without actually addressing like root tongue issues. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I also sort of delved even deeper into my tongue in singing obsession when working with my Chinese singers and then eventually developing a pedagogy series for singers in China. So that's yeah, amazing. That's, that's kind of my thing. If you want, if you have, if you want to figure out the freest way to sing, um, I'm probably going to start with your tongue before I'm even going to start with your breathing or your support, whatever that means. You know what I mean? So, right, right, right. yeah. Interesting. So, so, okay. So then now we're, we're, we're going to NEC, NEC. for, for a master's program in vocal mm -hmm. performance. Yep. And what was your experience like there? Um, it was medium. It was but okay. You, were, you didn't think that you had the ability to get in and you were so excited, but then when you got there, right. it ended up being a medium. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's a hard time to reflect on because, you know, I, I was 90 pounds heavier at that time. Um, and at that time, we were still all really talking about that and, uh, and, and coming down hard on that in front of each other. So uh, I was there during kind of a cutthroat time and yeah. I was paying a lot of money to be there because yeah. I, I mean, I fell into that trap of like, I'm so lucky to be admitted. I'll pay anything you want. And like, you know, if I knew what I knew now, no, now right. don't right. even, you know. Um, so I, I struggled because I was not as experienced as a lot of the singers who were there and because I was so heavy. So they didn't really give me much. I mean, I got better. I studied with William Cotton, who's now at Boston Conservatory and he was wonderful and a great teacher and very supportive. Um, sort of maintained my technique and, and polished it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my top got easier. My voice got bigger, moved into full lyric rep. Um, starting from but, something that was lighter or? Yeah, starting from something that was just kind of, I don't know what I am. You know, I started grad school when I was 21. So. Oh, right. Yeah. I was really young. Um, I'm not even sure if I really was a full lyric. I think it was also part, partially like a, a, an image thing. Right. You know, bigger how person, that is. Bigger a, rep that's a whole thing that happens. Yeah. I wrote an article about it a couple months ago. Um, so yeah, so I didn't really get to do very much. Um, and I felt, uh, behind and sort of, I don't know, I felt a lot of shame there. Like I wasn't, I just wasn't keeping up. And at that time, you know, there were sort of the star singers, which this happens in a lot of schools yeah. still, but I think the Academy is working a little harder to try to distribute opportunity more. Which academy? Um, academia. Uh huh. Got it. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute, which academy were you talking <laughs> Who? about? What do you mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, we just, they just put the same people in all the lead roles, and the rest of us just paid our 30K, 40K a year and kind of got what we could out of it. And it, it was a medium experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I discovered during my time there that I really loved Oratoria. So that was exciting. And I also, sorry, my dog is making noise. I was like, I think <laughs> that's a dog. <laughs> it is a dog. I also discovered that I liked new music and early music. So yeah. I, I, I got involved in other things and, and tried to find other opportunities in other ways. Um, I got a church job my second year um, and I got a gastric bypass my second year. Okay. How did, and, that, how did that, was that a decision that was solely based on well, I imagine that there was a numerous things that went into that decision, but um, was the idea initial? Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, puppy doggy. We'll have some questions for you later. I'll get, I'll get my Gracie girl. My Gracie girl is asleep in her in her little oh, hi. doggy bed over there. Are we talking about you? Are we talking about you? Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, so yeah, what, I mean, if um, I assume you bring it up, you're okay talking about I am what, fine what sort of, what sort of motivation, um, went into, to doing that? Was it, was it both health and um, singing business stuff? I mean, yeah, I it was, it was health. It was singing. It was just everything, you know, confidence. Um, I don't think I would have done it if I wasn't, <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, but I don't know that I would have gone through with it if I wasn't so fat shamed at NEC. So, yes, yeah. I mean, in some ways, I guess, and, and I mean, it was one of the best things I ever did in my life. So like in some ways, I guess we'll take the good with the bad from that. Um, sure. 
And for the record, my voice teacher had nothing to do with that, was totally not a fat shamer. Um, but I had a lot of experiences with, with that there that I think pushed me over the edge. So then my final semester, I got it done over the Christmas break. And then my final semester, I just like lost five pounds every, like, like every hour, like every hour I'd be like, Oh, there they go. <laughs> it was just wild. Yeah. Um, and I, I was fine because I strictly adhered to practicing every day, numerous times per day, having a structured practice plan knowing there would be changes, constantly checking in with the body. And um, like I said, breath was never really a big issue for me. So the surprisingly, the weight change didn't really change my breath too much. It definitely wow. at least temporarily changed my fog. To, to what? To lighter. Uh -huh. Yeah, it got lighter and brighter. And again, I don't know how much of that was specifically weight related because there's you know there was a lot going on i graduated i started going to summer programs i had a lot of different people telling me different things and um wow yeah but my whole life changed my whole life changed when i did that you know do you remember how much weight you lost and before you like did you get down to a certain particular goal weight and then you're like okay so that's how much i lost and then now moving forward this is what i'm trying to maintain or was it just more like okay we're gonna do this we're gonna see what what happens and then move forward with that? I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I ever really had a goal weight. If I did, I, de I never did reach it all the way. Um, but I think that the most, the, like the, the biggest amount was a hundred pounds and yeah, oh. I've kept, I've kept the majority of it off. I did have, did have two kids, but like, you know, it was a, it was a, a great decision and, and I certainly don't regret it. And um, I have no idea what my life would look like right now if I hadn't done that. Wow. I just have no idea. I like to think that I somehow in the windy path would end up right here. Yeah. But I just don't know if that's true. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hate that, uh, that you or anybody would have to go through a, a shaming, whether it be for being, you know, too big or t whatever. I mean, I, you know, I'll never forget when um, I was a grad student uh, at Indiana and I was, we were in a, we were in a theater, you know, I, I was born with one hand and uh, I was born missing my right hand. And it was a surprise to, to everyone because I guess on the sonogram or whatever, you know, they just didn't see anything. Um, but, oh, well, I should say they didn't see anything out of the norm. Um, but when I was born, they were like, oh, he only has one hand, you know? And thankfully uh, I was raised in a way that my mom and dad never, you know, said to me, well, now listen, because you only have one hand, you're probably not going to be able to do that. It was like, hey, we're going to enroll you in competitive swimming or hey, we're going to awesome. do this or what are you going to do. But I'll never forget being in the theater. And I think I was wearing like a short sleeve t-shirt or, or a, sh a shirt that exposed my arm. And because I was born with only one hand, I use my arm as my other hand. And so I'm very comfortable with my arm. Sure. And I will never forget when a very, very, very famous, well-known teacher came up to me and she said, oh, baby, no, you must hide this. Nobody wants to see this. This is, this is ugly. This is disgusting. Nobody I'm wants so to sorry. see you like this. And I, I had never in my life at that, up until that point, well, I was a elementary, junior high and high school kid. So I got made fun of, of course as you do. But I had never been like full on well, shamed for the way well, I Well, and it's always worse when very important people tell you things. That's right? the hardest thing. Then, it is you because know. you're like, well, you've been there and you've seen what is necessary. And, and then it was very quickly followed for me by doing a round of auditions um, where you can this very prominent company in Europe said, we would like to hire you for a fest contract as long as you have a prosthesis. That was the, you know, and I didn't have one at the time. And we were like, well, will you help us find the means to acquire Like, will you help pay? Without your money? prosthesis, you couldn't possibly get your vocal cords to come together and make your amazing sound all the time. <laughs> Again, one of my first professional reviews from a very well-known publication despite his own physical limitation, 
Weston Hurt has no right hand. He sang the role of Sharpless beautifully with lyricism, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, why yes. mention that? Like, yeah. I don't understand what yeah. the two things have to do with one another. So, and I don't mean to like completely call out NAC because I was fat shamed at every summer program as well before before the weight came off. Um, yeah. And and elsewhere, you know, but I, I in some ways that adversity was a great catalyst. So I agree. I hope I nobody agree. else has to go through it. And I've been very vocal about it. It's one of the many, many things that has shaped me into an advocate and an outspoken sort of uh, agent for change uh across the industry but you know that that was a big piece of it and uh, like i said my whole life changed i i i went to brevard i loved that summer that was amazing was dean um, anthony there when you were there uh, john greer was heading john greer. Okay. Up at that okay. time. yeah and john greer was the head of the opera department at nec mm. um, mm -hmm. and, and did not fat shame me uh and so yeah so I, I went to brevard i loved that then i spent a summer uh doing this crazy thing um <laughs> This is such a funny story. Have you ever heard of Kusasana? I don't think so. It's a, it's a, it's literally dirty dancing. It's a summer resort where every night there's a show and then the performers also have other jobs. And my dining room partner was Andrew Owens. Oh, wow. I, I know Andrew <laughs> so, Owens. I know. So I did a summer doing that where I would like have like lobster guts all over me and then go sing the Merry Widow as the Merry Widow. It was crazy. It was crazy. Um, That's amazing. But, like, certainly built character. Um, and I did not go into debt that summer. I made a lot of money. And then uh, I went to the Caramore program, the Britain Pierce program, the Opera Main program. Um, I think Caramore is called Teatro Nuovo. Teatro now, Nuovo but, now, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, you know, I was Crutchfield doing well. Yeah, they, I mean, Will Crutchfield and Rochelle, like from a, Brilliant. from a musical vocal perspective, like completely changed my life. Like they're in like the top 10 uh, musical influencers of my life. Um, Likewise. Yeah. Yeah, they are they so, are fantastic. Right. So so I went there for two summers. Um, and that was wonderful. And so, you know, I got a lot more opportunity. I placed in a ton of competitions and my book vocal, vocal studio was going well and I was singing oratorio regionally and just like things things just started happening. And so I you discovered did not, you, you have a, a DMA or a PhD? I have a DMA and but, that, but that happens, was later or or it was right you, in the middle. Oh, okay. Right the middle. Yeah. And where did I, you do your DMA? It's like funny how it all fits together, but uh, I started my DMA in 2009. So that was, hold on, that was right before my second summer at Caramore. Okay. Um, and when did you graduate from NEC? 2005. 2005. So, so there were four had, years in there that you mm -hmm. took off. I did the thing, total hustle, like just right, right. yaps and, and uh, teaching and local singing gigs and all the things all, all there in boston in the boston area yes i love boston an unreasonable amount it would take <laughs> a lot to ever get me to leave boston i just really really love it here i i have to agree with you on that it's one of my favorite yeah, cities it's pretty much the best it's awesome and you know it's gotten very expensive but i'm obsessed with boston and i've been here longer than now officially longer than i was in new york where oh, i grew wow. up so did you do, um, did you do your DMA also at NEC or was that something? No. Else? So I, I started studying privately with Penelope Bitsas, who was another oh, great yeah. influencer of my life and career and voice. And she was fantastic. And she really was like another great person for like relieving tongue tension. And, and just like, she was really focused on finding a rounder sound and she was wonderful. And um, we were talking one day and she was like, why don't you apply for the DMA? And I said, I spent so much money at NEC, like there's no way that I could right. possibly spend more money because you can't get a free DMA in Boston. Mm. Um, except I did. Oh, look at you. So yeah. So I went to BU. Um, they gave me a full ride. I was shocked. I was thrilled. Um, I went to I went to BU. I got my DMA. Um, but I got my DMA in like a really crazy way where like I still was working full time and doing other gigs. I did not participate in the opera program. Cause I didn't understand why I should, I'd been to seven young artist programs. Like why I just didn't, I didn't have time for that. I didn't want to be doing unpaid roles. I was on the roster of the Boston opera collaborative, which is like kind of like a young artist program here sure. and singing roles there. I had just done Alcina and I just like, I didn't want to do that. And so I literally, my DMA was mostly me driving up 
parking at the meter, throwing a bunch of quarters in, running in, going to rep class or like theory class or going to my lesson and then running back to the car before I got a ticket and then driving to work. <laughs> so it was wild, but I did it. Wow. Wow. Yeah, That's wild. amazing. Yeah. So. And working with uh, Penny the whole time. Yes. Yes. And, and, do you, and do you still work with her from time to time or? Not anymore, but but yeah. I do consider her one of sort of the the great uh, great shapers of my voice and yeah. Yeah. um and through my work at uh through my DMA at BU I got hooked up teaching uh, summers at the BU Tanglewood Institute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was there for seven summers, oh, and wow. uh, again, like amazing, like just totally life changing experience. Amazing, like really really loved being there really loved the the level of talent of those high schoolers was insane um and yeah I, I sort of worked my way through the ranks of the buti program in the summertime as like originally just voice faculty and then i took on like a faculty manager position and then mm -hmm. one summer they even let me run my own young artist programs for undergrads but it was too expensive so then we couldn't do it again but like that was a very cool i got to go to the shed and listen to concerts every night anytime um so you know, it didn't pay very well, but it was but absolutely, it was an incredible experience. I was yeah. there during when I was a faculty member at UMass Amherst, uh, UMass Amherst hired me for the interim position right when I finished the doctorate. So I've been fortunate in that, you know, I've had a lot of opportunity, but I've also always sort of like put myself out there and always been working to, to make my skills as sharp as possible so right. that I would always be hireable. Um, right. Yeah, I would say the biggest struggle between um, NEC and the completion of BU was just like, what is my voice part? Like, what am I singing? What is going on here? You well, know? And, to, and to quote one of my favorite people and singers and musicians in the entire world, Stephanie Blythe, fuck, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she I says. And totally I totally agree. A hundred million percent. By the way, Ian Howe says, I basically didn't sing a note on campus for my DMA either. <laughs> Hi, Ian. And uh, Valerie. Hi, Ian. Valerie Jean Becker says, um, Booty is a wonderful place for high school students. She taught there for 15 summers. It really is. Wow. It really is. Yeah. I, I miss it a lot. Um, I just, you know, couldn't, couldn't make it work. It's one of the most I, beautiful places kids. too. And I mean, just yeah. stunning. So trying to figure out your voice type, trying to figure out what rep really suited you and how to, how to market or brand, brand yourself, you know, um, in the rep. Yeah. What was, what was the, what was the biggest struggle? The biggest struggle was like, you know, losing all that weight and then swinging into like light lyric stuff that never really felt comfortable. And like, because it, of the range or what was the, because of the tessitura, tessitura it was never, okay. never, the, never a range issue. And I've always had very, very good agility. In fact, I consider my specialty as a voice teacher and singer to be the tongue and agility, like agility mm -hmm. and flexibility. That's my thing. That's um, like if you want to learn how to trill or you want to learn how to do fast passage work, like that's I saw what I you, you posted a trill <laughs> video the other day and I was like, this is amazing. This is great. I love trilling. And I think it's like such a pillar of good technique and laryngeal flexibility. So yeah, all about those trills. Um, but yeah, but you know, and then when I was with at, at Caramore with Will and Rochelle, they had me covering Adina and singing Janetta and like Adina was like almost comfortable, but not quite comfortable. Mm -hmm. um and because of the tessitura being yeah, because too high. of the tessitura just like that banging out in the passaggio constantly mm -hmm. um i also have a very naturally high sitting larynx which has been a struggle um like just as a human being right like this this is crazy but sometimes if i like am brushing my teeth and stick my tongue out like you can see my epiglottis like i just have a high sitting larynx really okay yep yep and so you know that was a challenge as well just to sort of like make sure that it didn't get higher than it already lived you would have been um, the ideal garcia uh, student <laughs> he would have been like ah i can see you <laughs> i can see yeah i right barely need a scope for me yeah. um so yeah so i i just it was like are you light lyric are you lyric are you full lyric are you a uh, color for a while it was like are you a lyric coloratura and i could like kind of scream out d's but it was just a disaster <laughs> Um, and Penny, Penny, Penny fi figured it out. She was like, okay, let's figure it out. Let's get settled. How did she figure it out? Just making sure that the voice was balanced and that yeah. things felt good and that I wasn't overworking. And, um, when you say you know, balance, balance from like a phonation airflow 
standpoint? Balance no? from a foundation airflow standpoint and balance from a chiaroscuro standpoint. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say it ever really fully balanced because I've always, like, since I was trained officially, I've always erred on the, on the Chiaro side. Mm. Um, but... From your musical theater beginnings <laughs> in seventh grade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in your mouth and go nah, 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 nah. that's kind of what happened <laughs> it was fun though um, i'm sure yeah so so i just it was really really tough because like really at the end of the day i i, I don't fit into a fach and i also love early music and i sing a lot of oratorio and i can trill and i can move and then it's like well is your voice light or is your voice heavy which one is it and it's like can't it be both i don't i mean it's just it's a lot of things and um, it's very, very hard to box in. And I guess if I had to explain myself in like an operatic way, I would say like I'm a big house Susanna and a small house countess. Sure. I mean, well, I was just going to say, ha has there ever been a role or, oh. or uh, a, a role in an oratorio where you've just been like this, this is the, why can't everything be written like this? This is the perfect tessitura for me. This is the perfect whatever for me. Was there ever something like that that just fit like a glove for you? I mean, Alcina. Alcina, yeah. the title Alcina. role? Alcina, title role, yeah, Alcina. Yeah. Uh, Fjordaligi is very comfortable now. It was a little bit more of a struggle, especially the, the the end. Yeah. You know, when I was still figuring out how to like not squeeze everything out in the passaggio, but Fjordaligi is super comfortable. Countess is super comfortable, uh, although occasionally rides a little low. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. From an oratorio standpoint, I mean, I love it all. I, I, I love it all. I sing it all. I love singing Bach. I sing the Brahms Requiem. I sing Mendelssohn. I sing Beethoven. I sing Dvorak. I sing all of it. I love it. Give me more. <laughs> Could not agree with you more. I, yeah, it's totally I my jam. I am passionate about that stuff. And I was, I've been very fortunate to have had a pretty balanced career performing wise that has included <laughs> opera as well as oratorio. It's great. And while, while the Marilyn Horn Foundation was around, I got to do quite a bit of recital stuff too, which was great. But that unfortunately has fallen well how everything has kind of fallen to the wayside yeah. here recently but but yeah so so you you're you're out of the dma and you're and you're doing your your programs and and so forth at this point focused on getting a full-time career going as a singer is that what your primary sort of i don't no, know focus i was, i would say that right right around the time i started my dma was when I was doing the best in like the young artist scene, which is ironic because my fuck was like all over the place. But yeah. Um, and I had started to get some, some, you know, interest from managers and I had been on a couple of gigs traveling and stuff. And I just, a few things came into play. One, um, I have always been naturally kind of entrepreneurial about money and somehow I think ingrained in from my family maybe i was just gonna like, say where did that come from because right singers like are not. yeah like for me work smarter not harder has always been a philosophy and that's really hard to adhere to as a singer yeah and i just and i also don't really like to travel and i'm not ashamed to say that i just i i'm happy to go on vacation and i'm more than happy to go on a couple gigs a year and be away but like the idea of being on the road forever like i really just it's just not for me. I don't sleep well. I have anxiety. I don't like I get motion sickness. Like it's just not my thing. Yeah. So um, there were a lot of things that sort of, and as I mentioned, I love teaching. I've been teaching this whole time while, you know, while we're All talking. I, yeah. And then I taught more through BU and my studio kept growing and growing. I've had a full studio with a waiting list for 12 years. Wow. That's amazing. And I mean, so, that, I mean, I say that that's amazing because that's that's incredible. I mean, I think that what, and we can start getting into this. I think that what schools oftentimes fail us is to understand what the world will really look like once we finish this particular degree, whatever it might be, yeah. and once we get out there. And let's say that we're doing our auditions or we're trying to make things work. Let's say we get a gig, you know, but like, okay, that's one job. What are you going to do with the rest of your time? How are you going to make this work? How are you, you know, and, and, and how to, to sort of organize your life in a way that's going to be productive, but also financially viable. And, you know, how do you make these things work? And so I say, you know, how incredible that is, is that you've had this full studio for over a decade um, and that it started well within 
when you were actually pursuing your education. So, I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, I've been very fortunate, but I've also been hustle, hustle, recruit, recruit, you know, lesson policies, charge what I'm worth. Like, I mean, that's a thing that's always been important to me. So, mm -hmm. um, long story short, I, I decided to double down on regional opera oratorio anywhere. Cause I'll travel anywhere for oratorio because the gigs are not long. Um, regional opera, oratorio, and recitals. I, I, I gave, I've given, I don't know, 10 full length recitals outside of the school system, just cause I really love giving recitals and, um, yeah. and teaching. I just sort of was like, this is what it's going to be. And then I'm going to craft everything around this because I know this is what's comfortable for me and it's lucrative and I can, um, put together this, this, you know, portfolio career doing these things and feel really happy and um and and it worked and then that is how i got into career coaching because uh i mean within all of this i founded an opera company which we haven't even talked about because my life is like a little hard to follow <laughs> well let's let's okay so so now now you fill your days primarily with how many different things <laughs> all the things. um I teach voice lessons. Um, I, I work almost exclusively with like post-grad emerging pro and pro folks. Okay. And, um, and I also teach six students at the Longy School of Music of Bard College, which is in Cambridge, um, grad students. So mm -hmm. I teach probably three to four voice lessons, six days a week. And then I do about depending somewhere between four and 12 career coachings a month uh during covid that was more like 30 yeah no kidding so that was wild <laughs> and um you know singing is obviously on pause for everyone although i try to stay active by making recordings yeah. and collaborations and getting myself out there and keeping things sharp so right uh, and I've had some virtual gigs and some like distance gigs, but nothing major. All my, all nine of like my major oratorio gigs were canceled. So including Carnegie Hall. So that was a bummer, Yeah. but we'll, we'll, we'll come back somehow. Um, That's right. I think we will. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, Mass Opera is the company that I founded. I'm the co-artistic director and the company's growing. So I, I mean, we've delegated a lot of, a lot of we have a whole chain of command so like i don't have as much responsibility as i used to with mass opera but um and when did that come time, into fruition uh during the doctorate which was 2000 uh, so oh nine oh eight oh nine okay. so it's been around, around about then. 10 years yeah Ooh. like 12 13 years yeah oh wow. so okay we've done 18 operas and uh how many do you yeah. typically do within a i mean does your season sort of run September-ish through May-ish, or do you have something that's a bit more? Yeah, more it runs year? September through May. The first, the first like eight years, it was only one production, and then we started adding a second production. Um, and that's what you do now: two productions per season. Yes, we try to. Although with COVID, I mean, everything's well, yeah, kind of who I'm knows. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so mass opera, um, I spend some time on during the week. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a daily thing, and um, and then so my. With all these things that I do, I was like, I need to get this all in one place, yeah. right? Because it just like, I love everything that I do, but it was it felt like this all the time. The I also chaos. have two kids. I have chaos. two kids, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and they're both boys. So like, <laughs> oh. well, when you told me that you had two kids and then you told me their ages, but now I understand that they're both boys. I, I that's a you should win all the medals because oh my I, god, it's just it's just it's insane right now. Yeah. I mean, luckily I thrive on like, <laughs> so <laughs> it's fine. And are they, are they going to school virtually or do they go to school? My two-year-old, we have a live-in, uh, Manny. Oh, okay. Uh, my live-in Manny hangs out with my two-year-old and my, uh, four-year-old is in school right now and it's going really, really well. So okay. hopefully they don't get shut down, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Spencer and Asher I, I, is another whole part of my life and, yeah. uh, I just needed to, to systematize and get everything under one umbrella. So I, I, my career coaching business was called the empowered musician from the empowered musician became the, came this Facebook spinoff group called the empowered singers group. And, uh, I decided to put basically everything I do other than my singing career and mass opera, which is its own nonprofit under the umbrella of the empowered musician. And so now the empowered musician is voice lessons um, with me or one of the teachers that I have hired to the empowered musician. 
career coachings, booking me for lectures and webinars and speaking engagements. Um, and we're also offering some class series, like we have an acting for singers class running right now. I am running an entrepreneurship 101 course for singers uh, starting October 25th. Wow. And we make everything super affordable. So it's like a, it's like eight hours of entrepreneurship 101 class for $135. You can't go wrong. Wow. Um, yeah. So so now it's it's. The, the web design and the relaunch of Empowered Musician as this new thing yeah. just happened. It just happened. So okay. I'm spending my time when I'm not teaching right now, like learning about contracts and talking to lawyers and, you know, talking to payroll about setting that up and figuring you, out. You created like, a, like an S-Corp or an LLC? LLC. Yeah. 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 Maybe come an S-Corp later. We'll see. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I run the Empowered Musician and and teach and career coach but i i don't like routine and i don't like to do the same thing every day like well, really don't like do well set yourself up to have a variety <laughs> of different things each day so that's yeah. good that's great yeah. that's, that's really great i would say the biggest challenge is just saying no yeah yeah you know yeah. at this point that's the hard part is like i want to do everything all the time and very much trying to exercise my right to say no to things so that's a that's a very valuable, valuable, but oftentimes um, challenging thing to learn to do. Um, right. You mentioned before, you know, charging what you're worth um, and setting a schedule and, you know, all of these things are, it's very easy to just go, yeah, oh, okay, okay, okay. What, I mean, speaking about that, you know, I mean, um, how, how does one, how does one find that type of I don't even know what to call it. Perhaps a, a um, inspiration to say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to up my fee. Or yeah, no, this is this is what this needs to be. I mean, what's what sort of influences did you have to? I mean, I'm not sure I know anyone like you. I mean, this the amount of projects that you have simultaneously going on, not just going on, but successfully sort of having your hands in and feet in, you know, full on, it's like, it seems to me like everything is working on all cylinders, which is uh, incredible. But well, a lot of it comes back down to the work smarter, not harder thing, though. Like, essentially, because people ask me all the time, like, literally, how is this possible? Yeah. And the answer is that, like, between the lessons and the career coachings, that's 20 sessions a week, right? That's 20 hours of my time, the other 20 hours at a high fee. Um, I charge what I'm worth, I probably should charge more, but I won't go there. Um, and then the other 20 hours to, to, let's be honest, the other 20 to 30 hours are spent curating my other things. Um, mm -hmm. And so it really comes down to how much money are you making in the amount of time you are working? And what right. does that leave you time to do, which gets me has gotten me very into like the the idea of correlating careers, which is something I career coach about a lot. Um, Talk a little and, bit about that. You mean, sure. Yeah. Correlating so, careers, like from, from, from what to what teaching and performing or from, or what do you, what do you mean? Um, so correlating career is like a term that I sort of coined and has, is being used a lot in the singer community to my great pleasure. And the idea is that a correlating career is any career that runs alongside a singing career. And, you know, Oh, I'm, oh. Yeah. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you that like almost every singer at some point in their life or for all of their life needs to have a correlating career. Yeah. And my whole thing about correlating careers is that A, you want to make sure that it's flexible enough to pursue singing. B, you want to make sure you are able to work smarter, not harder. And C, it doesn't have to be in music. And that's sort of the big thing is yeah. like, it's really okay to have a correlating career that's not in music. In fact, some people do much better that way where then they don't have that like passion dying because you're sort of, you know, cranking out the voice lessons or whatever it is that you don't really want to be doing. Um, and so I don't think a correlating career needs to be in music, but I do think we all need them. And the kids need to be educated that this is unfortunately, I wish I could change the fact that like, I wish I could change capitalism and the state of America and the 2008 recession and the fact that there's so many voice majors, but I, you know, I actually can change that last one working on it. But, um, but at the end of the day, like we all have to have a correlating career. Even most of my colleagues who sing at the Met have correlating career of some kind, some of the time. 
sure. unless you're independently wealthy or, or, or supported in some way. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's interesting how little that's actually talked about as oh how my God. insanely expensive you, this career is slash how wealthy you're expected to be in order to, you know, sort of mm -hmm. meet these little marks that the gatekeepers have sort of created for people in order to be. You mean the pipeline? Successful. The pipeline. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, so mean, it's just I'll bizarre. I would love it's to like... talk about the pipeline if you're, if you're game. Wait, what'd um, you say? I would love to talk about the pipeline if you're game. But enter, no, but, enter the pipeline. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so correlating careers, my, my thing with correlating careers is helping people find the right fit. And also really like the big thing here is we should be proud of our correlating careers. Absolutely. I don't, and, and, and people aren't, they carry singers, carry so much shame, so much shame, so much shame, so much shame all the time. And you can see that even in just the use of the terms day job, muggle job, backup plan, job, uh -huh, job, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, fallback plan, plan B. Like, I don't allow that terminology. I don't use that terminology. It's like, actually, we can be really, really proud of all the things we do. And that can be like part of us as multifaceted people who are in the arts, you know? Absolutely. I, that's, that's brilliantly put. And I, I was just talking to a, a young student the other day and she was like, well, I just feel like I mean, my friend told me that if I have a plan B, then that is already going to make sure that my plan A doesn't succeed. Yeah. That's, and that's I just like my the... jaw dropped. I was like, yep. hey, who is this friend? And what are, and I go, and I guarantee you, they're just like vomiting some sort of quote that they heard from some other teacher or person or whatever. I was like, that infuriated me that this was the idea. Good. Then, Good. No, 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 it no, 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 no. I mean, I would love to go down that whole rabbit hole, but all I will say is this, um, because it's so expensive to be a singer, the long, the, the more, the less broke you are, the longer you can stay in this game. Yeah. And the more likely it is that you'll end up in some, through your winding path, having singing in your life in a meaningful way. If you are not broke, starving artist, whatever. Now, some people thrive on the star starving artist thing and it works out for them. And I'm not saying that that's not a possibility. It's totally a thing. Sure. Totally happens. Um, it's just not, it's just not the majority of people. So the pipeline is what um, academia and opera companies and our industry in general prescribes to singers as this is how you become an opera singer. Right. <laughs> right. It's like it's like get your prescription pad. It's like okay, so you go to undergrad step for one. voice. Step yes. one. Go, go to undergrad for rock. voice. Right. And then you go straight to grad school immediately. And then but you gotta go to grad school. Have to, have to, have to. Um and then and like the more elite the school the better. So like don't worry about the price tag, just make sure it's like a really big name. Um and then from there, you do young artist programs. The, the more top tier, the better, because once you've got one, it's easier to get into the next one, which is true. Sure. Um, and then you do a bunch of competitions and then you get the attention of managers from your main stage performing and your, and your competitions. And then you get signed and then you have an opera career and you make a full-time living doing opera. The end. Congratulations. That's a pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do we think that that is very successful for most people no. at this point? Yeah. Anecdotally, about 1% of people who graduate from grad school it, with a voice degree, which has changed from a decade ago and two decades ago. It, it, was, it was a more successful, the percentages were much higher for a variety of reasons. Um, at this point, it's literally a lie. And it's damaging people not only in their psyche, but in their bank account. And it has to, we have got to be creating much more um, well-rounded, multifaceted, multi-classical genre artists if we want to, to keep this, keep everything alive, because the whole thing is, and, and, you know, some people go straight through the pipeline and have amazingly successful careers. Those are the 1%. And I'm super, super psyched for them. Sure. And then other people go straight through the pipeline and then they have a pretty good career, but maybe have dry spells and maybe they have enough to sustain them through the drive spells, or maybe they need a temporary correlating career or a part-time correlating career, whatever. Other people go straight through the pipeline and are like, I don't like this life at all. And I want to do this. Right. You know? Right. Um, 
but the majority of people don't go through the pipeline at all. And then they feel like failures. Mm -hmm. And then they look at their bank account and look at how much, how much debt they are in from school. And then you get also into the, into the gender parity, diversity, inclusion conversation. And it's like, you know, the problems, myriad, myriad problems with the whole system from both the academic side and the uh, professional singing industry side. And, right. and I think that, you know, massive change is needed on both fronts. And I'm very, very vocal about that. Which I think you should be. Um, I think that, you know, because most companies in America right now are closed up for shop. I mean, there are a few different things going on. Um, I saw tonight, I think Tulsa Opera is doing a production of Rigoletto uh, at the baseball field. They're doing like a, a huge, big outdoor, you know, open air stadium. The only problem is that Rigoletto actually has terrible gender parity, so that's a, that's a shame, but that's okay. What do you mean? Gender parity, equal number of female to male roles, but it's a great opera. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay, so when you, okay, so I've never thought about You want to do that conversation now? Should we do that one next? No, we, <laughs> We're an hour. We're an hour in at this point. Um, you know, I think it's it's. Uh, oh, I haven't been looking at Brianna. Me says currently supporting my pipeline singing partner and I with my correlating career. Nice. Kudos to well you. Well done, awesome. Brianna. Um, okay, so gender parity. Parity. Yes. Parity. Yes. Again, I love your work. I, I love this. Um, okay, so let's say standard repertoire pieces. Um, are you suggesting that standard repertoire pieces need to be no longer in the standard repertoire if they do not offer an equal amount of opportunity for the different genders in a opera? That is an excellent question. And no, I am not. My sort of, this is my philosophy. My philosophy is that the season needs to be at parity. Ah, okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. But but, but almost anybody... none are. What's that? Almost none are. Almost none are. So, but it's interesting. I mean, I just don't yeah. know how many people. I, this is the first time I've ever talked about. This is the first time I've ever heard. That's about insane, this. Weston. This the... That's insane to me. Like, how is I... that? Like, this conversation should be constant everywhere. So, can I just t say this one thing, and then we can we can banter say, about you it. You can say whatever you want. But like. Approximately 70% of voice and opera degrees in the last 30 years were awarded to women in the U.S. So 70-30 female degrees in voice and opera. The field is almost completely the inverse for opportunity, particularly in opera. If you just look at the numbers, and Brooke Larimer's made a spreadsheet. I mean, a bunch of people have made spreadsheets. Zach Finkelstein's working on some more, more on this yeah you have the opposite amount of opportunity so you're graduating majority women and then you're providing opportunities for majority men how is that okay and then nobody wants to do anything about it the academy's like well that's not my problem anyone should be able to get a degree and we don't need to have equal numbers of this and then the opera companies are like well we want to do this repertoire it doesn't you know long story short like the how do we gender yeah the gender disparity issue is massive and that's been one of my sort of big um like the I will die on this hill. I will die on it. Um, so for mass opera, 18 operas, 112 female roles, 53 male roles, which included wow. an all female Lobo M. <laughs> yeah, no, um, the, 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 did that okay? Forgive my ignorance, but did that start in Austin with La Femme Bohème? That yes, uh, okay, okay. I, I remember when the that Lola happened. Company, yeah, yeah that was yeah, not yeah. us. I have, some friends, I have some friends that are a part of that. Um, super cool oh, they're super cool my my one of my professional private students um brennan says can i say i've never heard of the term gender parity but i've talked about the same idea oh my God. I just <laughs> i'm gonna have a heart it. attack you guys <laughs> i'm sorry but i, I mean I, I i i'm sure that these conversations are happening but i just don't know that yeah. that they're so you know organized in, in ways that if aha uh -huh, this is what this is and this is how this is happening you know um, so the article yeah, that I'm writing with Zach Finkelstein and Hilary Labonte right now is called The Systemic Exclusion of Women in Opera. Um, and it's not just opera. I mean, opera opera tends to, to be where gender parity is the biggest issue. But so the academic programs and then and then in the actual opera world. And it's like literally the, the, the people you're graduating with these degrees has the inverse of opportunity. And so we have to do something about it from all angles. 
more female administrators, composers need to be writing, um, and librettists need to be writing with better parody. Oh, but I really want to tell this story. This is the story I want to tell. That's nice. Have you ever heard of a pants roll and or can this person be non-binary and or does it need to be a man? Um, I mean, there's just so many things we can do and, and the schools don't even want to, they don't even want to discuss it. And, hmm. and can I also say really important thing? Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm taking the opportunity because I feel like your audience is an audience I don't always get the ear of. Sure. Another, another thing is like the, the scholarships that male students are on for undergrad and grad school are being paid for by the women. Yeah. Well, you I'm can deny that, that all you want, but it's just fact. If you you're know? talking about numbers, of course, if there's 70% right. of the, you know, I mean, if you just look at anything, I mean, it's like, yeah. Well, whoever's the there on full men. ride is on full ride and whoever's right. not is obviously paying for those that are and if you have a larger percentage of people on full ride that are men than women then you're absolutely correct if that's what the statistic is at whatever given yeah. place you know so the women are graduating with two three four five times the debt and five six seven eight times fewer the amount of opportunities the worst debt i've seen in a career coaching by the way is 227k after grad school um, so, you know, we have a problem. Wow. We definitely have a problem and, and there are plenty of, and I think that COVID is like really rocking the boat. So I, I feel like, we oh, have absolutely. An I think in a number of ways. Absolutely. And obviously, you know, the diversity and inclusion factor is huge too, because now everybody's right. been called out. Like nobody can hide anymore. It's all out there now. Let's just like right. fix all the things. Um, right. so yeah, so gender parity is the hill that I will die on. Um, so I'm not saying don't do Falstaff or Rigoletto or, I mean, really like don't Pasquale, there's one woman in it really, but make sure that the season is at parody at a minimum, which means 50, 50, preferably you're reflecting the actual field a little bit more than 50, 50, but right, right, right. Yeah. That's interesting. I, and I love that. And, and, um, so to get back on your, on your earlier point of, there's too many people majoring in voice. How do we, what, what sort of issues do you see with that? And, and how do we go about helping that issue? I mean, that's a tricky one. I think, I think anybody basically can get a master's in voice at this point in the U S as long as they're willing to pay for it. Yes. Right. Some people feel that that's fine. Anybody should be able to pursue that as a passion. Yeah. Um, I can see that side of the equation depending on what mood I'm in. Um, but I think that programs should be much more competitive and better funded and have fewer people in them. And I think that, and it's tricky, right? Cause then there's the whole like, well, what about potential? You never know who's going to be a star. And I also yeah. totally get that. So this is yeah. a very complicated issue with a lot of variables. Um, and I don't know totally the answer, but I do think that the programs need to be at parity uh, or if they're not going to have parity in the degrees being awarded, then um, the seasons of the schools, the opera seasons of the schools need to be sure to have gender parity, which is another whole thing I could go on about. But um, so I think take fewer people, fund them with, with more money. And, um, you know, when it comes to... <laughs> It's such a complicated issue, but when it comes to how do we, how do we solve the problem? I think part of it is just people need to know what this industry really looks like mm -hmm. and they're not learning that in school. And then, then we get down, go down the entrepreneurship road of like, first of all, most people don't even know what entrepreneurship really means and, and that's okay. But or in this industry, what it would really look like other than just having really like a private like. voice studio. Sure. Sure. And you know, if a school is going to continue to take a massive number of singers, then at the very least, at the very least, their curriculum should be, uh, should include career coaching, entrepreneurship, uh, portfolio career, teach them how to make their own materials. What does it mean to be self-managed? Here's what a multifaceted career looks like. Here's how to have a diverse, a, a diverse offering of the types of repertoire that you have. I mean, I'm not saying be jack of all trades, master of none, but like, I think, um, 
we need to know what the industry looks like before we spend a hundred thousand dollars on undergrad, hundred and fifty K on undergrad, and then eighty, ninety, a hundred K on grad school. Like we just need to know more information. Well, I will say that at UMKC Conservatory, I'm teaching a class that used to be called or still is called uh I think it's something like opera role development slash audition techniques or something like that. I've cool. I've changed it and I've called it professional development for singers. Great. And I have tried, I've actually been using Claudia Friedlander's book. I'm not sure if you're aware of, yeah, of, the, of the handbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the handbook. And nice. I've been walking through that, but then in addition, bringing in um, different people uh, to talk with the class. It's a very small class. There's only three, there's only three students in it. One graduate student and two undergraduates. Cause it's not required. It actually, I, well, and I'm brand new. So I, it was actually, a. I found out I was teaching this class about a week before it, st it all started because I think they were trying to figure out who, whose responsibilities were going to go where. And right. so I didn't, I didn't really have um, time to plan out the whole thing or figure out what I was doing, but I figured out, okay, here's what I know that students usually don't get in most any schools. And here are the things that I have learned through living this career for the last 25 years. And so I really want to try to give them as much information as I can. So I've been bringing in people and I'd love actually if you we could talk about maybe you coming and talking to my little group because um, they well, I think and that be, brings up two points for me and like yeah. I'm so glad to hear that you're teaching that class and I'm so glad to hear you're using Claudia's book because I think Claudia is amazing and has been a huge instrument for change in the industry huge. agreed agreed huge um she's amazing uh but it brings up two things for me one is another issue is that a lot of the schools are not requiring classes like that and they should be requiring multiple classes like that. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, not just like one semester of like, yeah, career stuff. Okay. You know, like this needs to be a thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, or like, just because you're getting a degree in music doesn't mean necessarily you're going to be a performer. Let's learn other skills. Let's have business I'm classes. Let's I'm learn, married to one. You know? My wife, she has yeah. a bachelor of music and vocal performance, but she's been in the human resources industry for the last 15 years. Right. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I think, I think there there is a significant benefit of having a music degree that can shape your next steps. In, Absolutely, in, in a, a music degree, especially an undergrad degree, can be used for a, a number of things, and and there should be no shame in that. And we should know more about taxes and what is accrued interest and what yep. is what does it mean to start a business and whatever, right? Yeah. So yeah. one problem is that these things are not required. I think. Um, and then the other, the other thing that it brings up for me is just the idea of guests in schools mm -hmm. and the idea of guests with young artist programs and opera companies as well. And I absolutely want to hear from the 1% and from even, even just people who maybe didn't follow the pipeline, but somehow have ended up super successful as like well-known full-time singers. Mm -hmm. We always want to hear from those people and we always want to hear about their careers and their struggles and their triumphs. Yeah. But we, we must, as a, as a, in ac academia and as an industry, be talking to people who have crafted completely different types of careers, whether sure. it's in art song, in oratorio, in pro choral. A lot of singers that I career coach don't even know that they could be a pro choral singer as like a career. Like they just huh. don't know that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just hearing from people who really have portfolio careers and correlating careers. You know, I'm a trumpeter and a massage therapist and here's how it works for me. Like we right. have to be hearing from off the beaten path paths to understand the options that are available to us and to reduce the shame and the feelings of failure. I hate that there's shame involved. I so hate, much hate, hate that there's any kind of shame involved because I'm Huge. pretty sure that like, any of those 1% people who, I mean, I, I was very fortunate to be one of those pipeline people, as you call them. Um, you know, I very effortlessly, you know, sort of navigated my way through that and popped out on the other end, you know, halfway through my time at Juilliard, finding and securing management and then doing auditions, which led to a full-time performing career. So, but along the way, dear Lord, I mean, I mean, I was fortunate, like I said, to be passionate also about teaching. And so regardless of whatever success I had in the performing industry, I was always very passionate about teaching and, and keeping that going and trying to find opportunities. But like, 
I don't know any of my colleagues that are so out of touch um, with like the realities of like, I mean, now granted, perhaps I've just surrounded myself with a great group of people, but I mean, there, there are a small number of singers, let's say, that only sing at the Met. And they really, sure. outside of that, they don't do much else. And for them, this this whole COVID thing has hit in a way that sort of like, whoa, you know, because they literally lost all of their work. Right? I'm not and, at all saying that people are out of touch. I'm saying that young people learn from the exact examples that are in front of them. So, so it's not a matter of being out, out of touch. You can totally understand what's happening in the industry, but until they see someone who, you know, um, owns a coffee shop and, uh, and sings almost exclusively as an evangelist tenor or whatever. I see that, what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That there yeah. are just so many ways to do this. There are right. so many ways to do this. And, right. and we tend to be exposed almost exclusively to, um, full-time opera singers. And, you know, we all want to hear from full-time opera singers and we all want to know, what they have to teach us. Um, right, but we right. also just, we, especially in 2020, because so, so, so few people are going to be full-time opera singers. So few. Sure. So few. We have to know what else is out there to keep singing in our lives, whether it be, it, whether it actually contributes a significant amount of our income or not. Um, we just need to know the different ways that it can manifest and that that's okay. And, and that also helps people shape their next step. Right. Because pipeline is not is not um, a great choice for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So just just having a, a, a greater variety of what we're being exposed to as far as different kinds of career paths. I think that that is in, insanely important. And um, like I said, it's a thing that I'm trying to do. So so far, we've had speakers like Claudia Friedlander come in and talk awesome. with us about that. We've had one of my dear friends who's another Boston colleague, Sandy Pixetti came in and talked to us about balancing the career and being a mom and singing and so forth. And awesome. um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to bring in as many and as much diverse and sort of interesting dynamics as I possibly can, because I agree That's with great. you. I think it's, it's, uh, it's only, well, and again, I, I, I just, I hate that there's shame. I don't I have never even seen it like that, but like I would want, and it would hope for that, like anybody who is, pursuing that it's because they're passionate about it because they want to make something happen and then if they're initially unable to make enough money doing the thing that they're trying to get going they do another career that gets going and they're still side you know they're they're doing their side hustle or they're doing the whatever the thing and then eventually the things become just things that you do right it's like you said I run a coffee shop or I work in a coffee shop or whatever. And then I also sing evangelist um, for all the passions that are going on around this particular geographic, area. like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Why? Okay. Awesome. Great. It's just not more power to you. Deal. They come into career coachings, you know, more often than not that the, the initial thing is, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing at this career. And it's like, are you, or, or do you just need to reframe it and think about um, new solutions and new ideas, create your own opportunities, create a concert series. Uh, I mean, there, there are just so many things that you can do when you think outside the box. I mean, I've yeah. seen people come up with the craziest things and, and so many of them are awesome people tying together their correlating careers with their singing careers. Right. Um, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. And I just, I, I, I hope that, that academia and the industry is, is able to serve the singers of tomorrow by making sure that they're not just, you know, steeped in hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and have no idea about how to navigate this world, which has changed a lot. It's changed a lot. You know, well, I can only imagine that these students of yours and those who are waitlisted that might get the opportunity <laughs> to work with you, are learning a wealth of knowledge from your experience and from your passions. And uh, we can only hope that they will go on to, to continue the work that you've done. And um, yeah, how fortunate. I am I'm, I'm so glad that we have uh, been able to talk about these things. And this was Thank the whole- Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so, uh, you know, I, I know that you and I don't know each other too well, but like yeah. everything I've heard about you and when I when we have met, I've just always been like, so curious about you like 
<laughs> she just always seems like she's like she's like working it like there's so many things that you're going and doing and and i i can't thank you enough for being on here and sharing your your passions with us and 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 advocacy because i think it i think you're right COVID has really you know sort of like turned it on its head and and there's no way to come it's exposed back. everything yeah exposed it but i'm saying when we come back and we are going to come back um it's going to be different and different and i think in a very very good way I hope so. Yeah. I, th I, I, so. I don't know if there's another option because like you said, I mean, everything is exposed. There's nothing to really hide from at this point. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that uh, people are going to have to fall in, in line because if, if not, they're going <laughs> to, they're not going to do too well. I also realized that I got into my career ramps before shouting out my current voice teacher. Oh, who's your current voice teacher? Uh, Steven Smith. W. Oh, Steven I know Smith. that guy. Yeah. You know that guy. Um, I, I love that shout, guy. I mean, What's I just want to make sure to, to not complete this without shouting out Steve, who uh, I met in 2014 and who I've been working with ever since, who has really just made singing so easy and really Absolutely. like changed a lot about my philosophy as a singer and teacher and um, has been another one of my sort of top 10. And I wanted to make sure that... I gave him his shout out that he very much deserves. Yeah, I agree. He um, he and I started working together in, in, when I first got into Juilliard in 2002. And um, I went out to Aspen to continue my work with him. And I was with him for about, about nine years, I guess. And and uh, I mean, I was with him through the whole point of him writing the uh, the phase of his life of writing the Naked Voice book. The Naked Voice. And um, yeah, I'm on all those recordings, you know, for the CD. That's awesome. Yeah, on the CD. It's, it's so such funny. a It's such an incredible... I mean, I will say this from S Stephen Smith, the way that he has organized his life and organized his teaching and the boundaries that he's created and the, I, I had never witnessed such a black and white, just sort of like, this is how we do this. And this is how we do this. And this is how this is, you know, just the whole idea of like, the two basic fundamental principles of singing are phonation and airflow. And we isolate those two principles with these exercises and we combine them to create this exercise and just understanding it in a way of simplicity that had never been really laid out for me was, I was just like, huge. Wow. And I have to say that as a teacher, it's something that I use on a daily basis. It, it hit the, the principles scattered all throughout, but I mean, his, his, his step, you know, by step process for learning new repertoire step-by-step -step process for how to sing coloratura and fioratura um you know i just think and also the boundary that he has of like i don't need you as a student the I first time about, okay but know? let's talk about the first time i ever heard him you're give like that what? speech i know i was like what do you mean it? i've you always been so me. close to my voice teacher you know i've always <laughs> really he's like i don't need you in my life my life i care perfect. about you I care about right. your voice, but I don't right. need you. I mean, that's huge. That is a boundary and that is a healthy thing. And I wrote an article recently called Healthy Student Teacher Relationships. Which I read is all that. About, like, I love it. What's not kosher anymore, you know, I, to get I away love with it. And, and, I, I, yeah, I love the list that you have at the end where you just sort of. Red you, flags. You see it. Yeah, the red flags. Run, exactly. run for your life. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, boundaries are important. And, yeah. But yeah, yeah, you're right. And I have to say that while I was initially shocked to hear that, Looking yeah. back on that, my God, has that served me in such yeah, a wonderful way deal. of being like, okay, I care about you. And, and it also, you know, after I had been with him for like almost a decade, I knew that it, for me, it was time for me to move on. I was, yeah. I was um, at a place in my career and in my singing and me personally, I needed something different. And I knew that he would still have respect for me and that I can still have respect for him by leaving, leaving him and going to a different teacher. Not an issue. No big it deal. It should always be like that. And when I was at uh, uh, last year, I was at Lyric in Chicago, and I got to sit in on a friend. A friend of mine had a voice lesson with him up in up in Evanston, and I was like, "Can I come with you? I haven't oh, seen him in so nice. long." And I walked in the door, and he was like, oh, "What?" And of course, I saw him, and I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, he he, <laughs> he too has lost so much weight. He yeah. looks amazing, better than he's yeah. ever looked. I mean, he's he he goes on and on about it. So anyway, huge shout out to Stu Smith. Love him. Huge shout and, out. Uh, Great. That's great. Yeah. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for being here with me and uh, with us. And yeah. um, we, we've had, oh, Kristen Larson. I, we've had so many people who were just like basically chiming in and saying how awesome this conversation is and oh, that they're good. in agreement. So great. this has Everybody been great. Everybody check out the empoweredmusician.com. Yeah. Empoweredmusician.com. <laughs> yeah. 
massopera.org mm -hmm. is the opera company yeah yeah and um what else oh your personal my, website yes my website is danavarga.com there you go and right now it's like fun corona collabs and stuff and then when the world is open and you see lots of oratorio <laughs> that's right that's right well thanks Great. again and I, yeah. I i mean it i'm gonna i'm gonna be in touch hopefully we can get you to come talk to my little group about Sounds all great. of these things because i think they would they would love to hear we got like i said there's two undergrads and one grad student and we have a fun we meet twice a week but uh we have a fun time very and, cool uh, they'd love to hear from you so nice well thank all you. right thanks so much have a good rest okay. of your friday and have a great weekend you too bye okay. bye